Howdy y'all, welcome back to the channel. Today I'd like to share with you a ziggurat from the ancient and lost city of Babylon. Why I find this important, in my last video, we discussed the Boro Budor in modern day Indonesia, that structure being the largest Buddhist temple in the entire world. Within the current narrative, history, that we are told of Boro Budor, we find strong evidence of not only a fishy discovery, as it was said to be lost for anywhere from 400 to 1000 years, buried under volcanic ash and forest overgrowth, only to be dug out privately in the early 1800s by British colonizers, with very little documentation. But within this narrative, we also find evidence that Borobudur was created by a group I'll term as the First Men. At this point, the term Tartars or Tartarians is accurate, but it seems to dilute many from the actual subject matter at hand. Ancient accounts worldwide in all cultures make reference to a group of highly sophisticated individuals who made use of arithmetic, advanced mathematics, astronomy, as well as language, which led to harmonics and also, more specifically, the first use of baked, not earth-dried bricks. The amalgamations of the stories of these first men led to a slew of different names depending on which culture and location stories you were referencing. Some of the most popular names for these individuals, or the most common, being the Celts, the Tartars, the Saka, the Sakai, the Huns, the Saka Akim, the Hakim, the Chaldeans, the Saxons, etc. These were said to be the olive or bronze skinned red haired men of immense size and intelligence. Their described appearance almost a foreshadowing of their mysterious nature. In Anacalypsis by Godfrey Higgins, as well as many of the works by Strabo, we see references to this ancient hive, which for centuries produced the educated minds, the scientifically gifted builders, who would embark from northern India and northern Asia into the rest of the unaccounted for world. While you can't just take my word for this, we do have documents which I always leave references to in the description of these videos. Anacalypsis alone has over 1,000 references to pre-1833 works on history and science which back up the author's claims. But alas, we are talking about the first men here, their sagas, the very word saga, deriving directly from saka, leading to the myths of the Vikings, the Golden Horde, the Celts, the Scythians, later castes of an earlier hive that was once peaceful and united. Now, let us tie this back to the Bible. We have the story of the Tower of Babel. If you're unfamiliar, Babel was a tower in the ancient city of Babylon, roughly 55 miles south of modern day Baghdad. At the time of its peak, Babylon was a city of over 200,000 people. According to the biblical text, after the great deluge or great flood, the united human race worshiping one God and speaking one language migrated to the land of Shinar. Here, they decide to create a tower to reach the heavens to question God for his judgment in bringing the deluge. God again brings judgment and his wrath upon the people. He confounds their speech and then scatters them across the world with no memory of their past. The exact biblical text reads as such. The whole earth had a common language and a common vocabulary. When the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Then they said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered across the face of the entire earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people had started building. And the Lord said, If as one people all sharing a common language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be beyond them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language, so they won't be able to understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there, across the face of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the entire world, and from there the Lord scattered them across the face of the entire earth. Genesis 11, 1-9. Similar myths are found in Sumerian, Assyrian, Greek, Roman, Mexican, Native American, Nepalese, Boswanan, Tanzanian, Congolese, and Burmese. The lengths at which this story, this godly warning, seem to have reached around the world have no bounds, much like the documented advancements of the first men themselves, who followed similar lines of travel and in all likelihood could have been the progenitors of the Tower of Babel mythology or even those that were afflicted. That being said, the ancient structure discussed in today's video fits the description of the Tower of Babel nearly perfectly, while also resembling in many key ways the ancient Borobudur structure discussed in my last video. So now, let us look at the ziggurat of Etamananki in Babylon, 
Just as in the Borobudur, the ziggurat is said to create a path for those who intend to ascend it. The structure is meant as a dedication to both the abilities of man, as well as an acknowledgement of sorts, that this knowledge and power have been derived from and provided by God. In this sense, many of the most ancient structures serve these very same purposes. We can see that these monuments to the gods are a sort of way to grab God's attention. Nowhere does this sort of legend become more important or more infamous than in the case of the Tower of Babel, oddly, while Etamenanki is merely an infrastructure, a fallen outline of the superstructure that once stood, and while it sits in the exact location agreed upon by scholars to be Babylon, we still do not have an understanding that the ziggurat of Etamenanki was in fact the biblical Tower of Babel. However, what we do have is some pretty revealing information as inscribed on different portions of the ziggurat base, which have been excavated so far. But first, let us break down what the modern narrative tells us about the ziggurat of Etamenanki. Then to conclude the video, I will read those excerpts discovered deep in the excavations of the ziggurat, which may help reveal to us its true nature. Etamenanki is dedicated to Marduk. Marduk is an ancient Mesopotamian god whose name means solar calf or calf of the sun. In my video on Anacalypsis, we established the importance of the sun to the first men who used the sun, the moon, and the stars to create their first proto-religion. The sun being the main deity in that religious trinity, we also have the sun calf of Babylon, Marduk, rising to the head or main deity of the Babylonians. In the previous video, we made ties to the ancient Hindu and Buddhist cultures, which seemingly arose from this cosmic balance early on in the establishment of the first men. Thus, we can see the holiness of the sun cow, or Brahmin, being of the utmost importance. The calf was noble, innocent, was a provider, just as the sun provided the first men with nutrition, sustenance, and direction. Marduk was the god of creation, as in not only life, but creation of structures, or earthly forms, and of man's ability to create. Marduk was also the god of justice, medicine, and magic. These are the exact traits, or job titles, which the first men held, according to Higgins in the Anacalypsis. We have the sages, the medicine men of Egypt, the Sejin, or Sejin, the magicians, or soothsayers, as well as the Hakim, the shamans and doctors of the East. We also have the Kohen, the spiritual leaders, and the Khan, said to be warrior leaders, but more likely, they were closely related to kings as the first men are said to have declared a sort of feudal reign everywhere that they went. As hundreds, if not thousands of years would pass, these languages, while all similar, would change ever so slightly, but we can still see the similarities in all of the root words, and even more so when we see that the descriptive epitaphs of all these people allude to certain jobs which fell under the control, so to speak, of the ancient god Marduk. The first men, for all intents and purposes, were the Mardukes of their communities. But here is where it gets even stranger. According to some ancient texts, the ziggurat of Etamenanki, built to worship Marduk, or to worship creation, wisdom, magic, and medicine, the jobs of the first men, also was associated with the god Bel. Bel is said to have been an amalgamation of gods, including Marduk. If you watch any old world videos, I need not explain why Bell is important, but for those new to this subject matter, the shape of the modern day instruments, known as bells, and their usage throughout time has become quite a topic of discussion on our channels. Bells, harmonics, sound resonance, the ability of sound to not only heal, but to destruct, have been discussed thoroughly on multiple channels. We have ancient accounts from the Middle East of magic using sound to gravitate or float objects into place. In modern times, we have complex understandings of sound, including string theory, which basically breaks down all matter into tiny, inconceivable waves. For centuries, we have bell towers, belfries, cathedral towers, being some of the tallest buildings in the world besides, let's say, the Great Pyramids. Every major city or town from pre-1900 was seemingly founded with a huge bell of some sort and a tower to house it. Do we know exactly what this means? We do not, but an interesting narrative arises as we research the ancient deity known as Bel, more specifically as we read the story of Bel and the dragon. Essentially, every night, thousands of people would come to the Tower of Babel, 
or this ziggurat that we're talking about today to dedicate food and sacrifices to Bel. Babylon being one of, if not the largest city in the world at the time, you have thousands of people throwing away their needed food, their needed belongings, their wealth, and even sacrificing family members to try and appease the gods. Why did they keep doing this? Call it trickery or call it ancient gullibility? But there was a Hebrew wise man by the name of Daniel who began to question these practices. He began to question the king or the Khan or the Cohen. The king responds, the god Bel takes the offerings as they are gone every night by the morning, claiming he did not want to displease the gods. So in heroic fashion, Daniel sneaks into Bel's altar after dark and he spreads volcanic ash through the altar floor. The next day, upon entering the sealed altar with the king, Daniel shows the king all of the footsteps of the Bel priests that were left in the ash. He proves that the priests would come nightly and take all of the food, the money, and even the bodies that were left for Bel, and then they would allow the public to believe it was a miracle provided by the god. The priests admit their wrongdoing, and they are all put to death. The story not only shows the evilness of men and the power of power to corrupt, but it also shows this disconnect between the seemingly naive king and the priests who were supposed to be under him, who are actually undermining him and tricking all of the people of Babylon. Why this story becomes important? In its conclusion, Daniel the wise man first attempts to reveal these tricks of the priests because there is said to be a dragon that is living on top of the ziggurat. The people of Babylon believe the god Bel is protecting them from this dragon and they revere the dragon. So after the priests of Bel are caught subjecting the people of Babylon, it is written that a great man comes to rid Babylon of the dragon. In many aspects, this dragon can be seen as Bel or the false version of Marduk, Marduk being the one true sun deity. This is echoed in who is said to have defeated the dragon and how. In some versions, we are told Daniel himself defeats the dragon, while in most versions, it is Alexander the Great who comes to Babylon and defeats this dragon. However, the way of destruction of the dragon is always very similar or always the same. It is literally blown apart or blown up. In one version, Daniel feeds the dragon straw filled with burning hot coals. In another, Alexander the Great feeds the dragon flesh covered with poison and burning tar. However, in both stories, for lack of a better term, the dragon explodes. Now, bringing this completely full circle, stay with me. We have the legend of Marduk, for which the ziggurat of Babylon was built, who, in Mesopotamian mythology, is the god of the sign of the wind. In an epic battle, Marduk, the one true god, defeats the water god, Tiamat, by controlling the earthly winds, causing Tiamat to burst, just like the dragon, representing the false amalgamation god, Bel, being burst by Alexander or Daniel. Furthermore, the ziggurat of Edamanaki or Babylon in later times was likely also the tower of Jupiter Belus, which stood in Babylon. This tower, often confounded with the Tower of Babel, often confounded with the ziggurat of Edamanaki, was also eventually said to go from worshipping the sun calf Marduk to worshipping Bel. Just like this story of the fallen dragon, Alexander the Great would arrive to Babylon in the current narrative. We are told Alexander ordered the ziggurat of Babylon to be demolished, but only because it was severely in disrepair. Could this be due to the fictional dragon battle that took place on top of it, which could have been a metaphor for something different? Either way, we are told Alexander planned and ordered the ziggurat rebuilt in all of its glory and only demolished it to have it rebuilt larger and more sturdy. However, Alexander the Great died before the ziggurat was even remotely close to being finished, and construction following his death would often follow similar proceedings to his. The new builder would tear down the old remains in hopes of starting fresh, only to face delays and then abandon the project. We are told Babylon was completely dissolute, unrecognizable, and abandoned by the year 1000. For the next 800 years, Babylon was looted, forgotten, and what remained of its very old roots were torn away, as Babylon is said to have been one of the richest sources of bricks used in the Middle East in medieval times, seemingly implying 
that later cultures would not be able to replicate the feat of building thousands of bricks. That's an entirely different can of worms though. Now that we've established what the ziggurat of Edebanaki or Babylon is, where it is, and that it is in all likelihood, according to modern day scholars, the location of the biblical tower of Babel, I would like to now share with you two of the discovered inscriptions within the foundation stones of the ziggurat. I believe these written accounts will shed some very revealing light onto the narrative as well as providing you with a first-hand account of what the ziggurat of Edomanaki could have looked like in all of its original glory. Mind you, just as these inscriptions were found many centuries after the ziggurat fell, we must take what they say with a grain of salt. The ziggurat, originally said to be built during the time of Hammurabi, roughly 1775 BC, is said to have been repeatedly rebuilt, coupled with constant additions to achieve the tower that many of us picture in our minds today. Here is what the original inscription found in the ziggurat has to say. The first comes to us from a stell found in 1917 during excavations by Robert Caldaway. The stell contains the short royal inscription of King Nebuchadnezzar II. It reads, Etimanaki, ziggurat, Babili, I made it, the wonder of the people of the world. I raised it, its top to the heavens, made doors for the gates, and I covered it with butamen and bricks, end quote. The second, longer inscription, comes to us from the foundation cylinders uncovered in the 1880s. Their verified inscription reads, At the time, my Lord Marduk told me in regard to Edomanaki, the ziggurat of Babylon, which before my day was already very weak and badly buckled, to ground its bottom on the breast of the netherworld and to make its top reach the heavens. I fashioned maddocks, spades, and brick molds from ivory, ebony, and muscanu wood and set them in the hands of a vast workforce levied from my land. I had them shape mud bricks without number and mold baked bricks like countless raindrops. I had the river, Aratu, bear asphalt and bitumen like a mighty flood, through the sagacy of A, through the intelligence of Mardu, through the wisdom of Nabu and Nesaba, by means of the vast mind that God who created me let me possess. I deliberated with my great intellect. I commissioned the wisest experts, and the surveyor established the dimensions with the 12 cubit rule. The master builders drew taut the measuring cords. They determined the limits. I sought confirmation by consulting Samus, Adad, Marduk, and whenever my mind deliberated and I pondered, unsure of the dimensions, the great gods made the truth known to me by the procedure of confirmation. Through the craft of exorcism, the wisdom of A and Marduk I purified that place and made firm its foundation platform on its ancient base. In its foundations, I laid out gold, silver, gemstones from mountain and from sea. Under the brickwork, I set heaps of shining sapsu, sweet-scented oil, aromatics, and red earth. I fashioned representations of my royal likeness bearing a soil basket and positioned them variously in the foundation platform. I bowed my neck to my lord Marduk. I rolled up my garment, my kingly robe, and carried on my head bricks and earth. I had soil baskets made of gold and silver, and made Nebuchadnezzar, my firstborn son, beloved of my heart, carry alongside my workmen earth mixed with wine, oil, and resin chips. I made Nabu Samasar, his brother, a boy, issue of my body, my darling younger son, take up Madoc and spade. I burdened him, with a soil basket of gold and silver and bestowed him on my lord Marduk as a gift. I constructed the building, the replica of Isera, in joy and jubilation and raised its top as high as a mountain. For my lord Marduk, I made it an object fitting for wonder, just as it was in its former time.